Good morning, everyone. Again, welcome to Masterclass uh, Season 3. Uh, you are aware that we had a Masterclass Series 1 and Masterclass Series 2. One we had in 2020 when uh, we had the COVID times and then we started uh, the Masterclass and uh, there was a huge success of uh, Masterclass uh, uh, season, season 1 when we had uh, 32 lectures on various uh, GI, GI topics and they are still very popular. Then last year we had a Masterclass Season 2 and when we talked about 12 cases of clinical case discussion that also was uh, quite uh, appreciated by a lot many people. Now after that uh, uh, we thought that uh, uh, why don't we discuss about the uh, GI pathology and GI radiology and therefore uh, we decided that uh, we should uh, have a third series of master class that is uh, on GI pathology and GI radiology and this is the first uh, lecture first session on the series three of uh, ISC master class. Uh, in this series we'll focus uh, four lectures or four, four discussions on GI pathologies and then four uh, on GI radiology. In pathology, first we'll, we'll talk about uh, liver pathology, then small intestine, large intestine, and esophagus and stomach together as a fourth one. And then we go to GI radiology. So again, welcome to masterclass. And for this masterclass, uh, we have uh, uh, one of the most uh, astounding professor of pathology and uh, our mentor, I would say, uh, Dr. Siddharth Datta Gupta. Siddharth Datta Gupta, uh, had joined Ames New Delhi uh, as a student uh, in 1981, and he has a very illustrious career. And he, uh, in 2020, he super animated as a professor of uh, pathology uh, from uh, Ames New Delhi. He also served as a dean of examination of Ames, and he he led to number of uh, positive changes in the exam section uh, in Ames. Dr. Gupta is a is a wonderful teacher. And, in, and the way he describes pathology and the, the way he teaches with his own creativity is, is, a, is a fantastic. And uh, he kindly agreed to uh, talk to all of us on the topic of the liver pathology. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Gupta, and welcome to IUC Masterclass. And, and to moderate and chair uh, this session, we have a Dr. Uh, C.E. Epen, like a very dear friend, and uh, very, um, one of the top uh, hepatologists in our country. He's head of hepatology at uh, CMC Vellore and uh, is a great teacher. Uh, thank you, Dr. Epan, for uh, accepting to, to be moderator for this session. Uh, we have a Dr. Mahesh Goenka. I think all of you know Dr. Goenka. Mahesh Goenka is uh, now president of uh, our society. And, and again, he's one of the top endoscopists uh, globally, known globally and again in our country. Uh, he, he is one of the best teachers uh, uh, I have ever met. Uh, and, and now I hand over to Dr. Goenka uh, to, to uh, address uh, you and introduce Master Class. Thank you, Govind, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure as the President of Indian Society of Gastroenterology to be uh, starting and welcoming all of you for this third session of uh, Master Class IHG. Uh, I must say that the first two sessions, I had the opportunity of attending a majority of them, and they were really very, very uh, educational. And I think those who have attended those sessions will understand the value of these sessions. Uh, I must say that Indian Society of Gastroenterology is one of the rare societies which are always looking at opportunities to teach our youngsters, postgraduate students, uh, DM and DNB students. We have various uh, platforms. YCP uh, is one platform. Gym is another platform. And we are starting with another platform very soon for the second year DN, DMB students, uh, which will be uh, how the guidelines and the method of dealing with various diseases. That will be the first time we'll be starting. So I'm very happy that today we are starting with liver pathology and you have two stalwarts in liver. One who is possibly the, one of the best clinician, Dr. Ethan, uh, in this country and around. And also Professor Dr. Gupta, as uh, Govind rightly said, is pioneer pathologist. We have all learned from him, even if we have not been his students uh, during his uh, deliberations in conferences and workshops. So uh, I look forward to this and subsequent sessions of Masterclass. From the student's perspective, I'll tell you that please inform the rest of your colleagues as well. This is a golden opportunity to educate yourself on these two areas, which we usually don't discuss much, at least in all the colleges. 
uh, radiology and pathology, which are so integral part of our training as well as our clinical practice. So with that brief introduction, I'll pass on to Dr. Ethan to carry us through this session. Uh, just one more second, that uh, there's a chat box. So if you have any question, uh, please do write on the chat box. Dr. Ethan now. Thank you. I would, uh, first of all, would like to appreciate the strong leadership and vision, vision provided by the ISG office bearers, Dr. Goenka and Dr. Govind Makari as president and secretary of, of the society of taking on academics and teaching as one passion for the country. And this is bound to have effects and will impact the care delivered to patients across the country. So today's topic is liver biopsy and I'm, I must say I'm looking forward to learning from Dr. Datta Gupta's vast experience in the next uh, hour or so, hour and two, to listen to what he will teach us. Liver biopsy is not taken lightly as a procedure and because of the seriousness of the of the procedure per se, the patient and family also views it a little differently and apprehensively await the results of the biopsy. As with all biopsy, interpretation of the result and conveying, conveying it to the patient in an understandable manner is the responsibility of the clinician, not the pathologist. So it's very important that the pathologist, that the clinician understands what the pathologist is talking about and then conveys the impression of the, the findings of the biopsy to the patient appropriately. It's equally important to have uh, open and frank communication between the clinician and pathologist to help improve the, the findings and the analysis of, uh, of this procedure. So with that brief uh, two-line introduction, I would now invite Dr. Datta Gupta to give his talk. So. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ethan, for those kind words and introduction. And I'm, at the outset, I must thank Dr. Goenka, Dr. Makaria, and the entire ISG. Uh, I've attended several ISG conferences and forum. I've been closely associated with gastroenterologists. And during my period of work, invariably, my evening tea would be with one of them in the institute. So that's how closely we used to work. And uh, and I, as an outsider, I can vouch for one thing. ISG is one organization in our country that has always worked for educating all their members and others in gastroenterology. This is hardly any other organization other than maybe the pediatric, academy of pediatrics, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, which do such wonderful job in uh, in uh, educating this one. And this is absolutely wonderful. I feel honored and privileged to be part of today's deliberation. So with this, I think I'll start. Can I share my screen? Yes. yes. Thank you once again. Dr. Gupta, if you can increase the volume, if you have a... Okay, okay. I'll increase the volume. Now, now is it okay? A bit, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, now we come to the, I'll introduce mainly to the, how we interpret liver biopsies. It's not possible to do the entire thing in one day, but at least it will give you an overview of the interpretation. Oh, yeah. okay. The liver is a wonderful organ. And if you see in your training of gastroenterology, hepatology forms a part. Liver diseases, unfortunately, are a common cause of morbidity and mortality in this country. And especially because we have high rates of HBV and HCV. And this is something that all of you are well aware because of our population. In fact, 1% uh, the rate of any illness, incidence or prevalence, if you multiply by the billions, it's almost equal to any European country. 
So, you know, always we deal with large volumes of diseases. Even if it's 0.1%, it may be like one of the small entire population of a country in Europe or in some other place. Unfortunately, for liver diseases, there are very few centers that are dedicated, except now gradually because of transplants, it's been increasing. The main reason is most liver diseases are difficult. You have acute liver failure, chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis. They are almost very difficult to treat, often medically. Therefore, it appears less rewarding. You require a huge teamwork. The pathologists, radiologists, every, the gastroenterologists, and other supporting departments. And there are very few histopathologists. We are a dying tribe, actually, which could uh, who work with hepatologists. And even trainees apparently are not interested because uh, endoscopy is perhaps more lucrative. So luminal gastroenterology is better. So with this, and there's a fear of liver biopsy, both in the clinician, often more than what's in the patient, as Dr. Epen rightly pointed out. There are many things associated with this. And there's very limited specialization in histopathology of the liver. So it's very important that you know why the liver biopsy is necessary, how it's performed, and what does it convey. So we'll go to the indications, technique, interpretation. Liver biopsies are mainly used for diagnosis of certain liver diseases and more so nowadays for systemic disease, because our major load of liver biopsies was for chronic hepatitis. And nowadays, you have excellent non-invasive tests, and you hardly require a biopsy except for staging and grading. So some of the indications have become less over the year, but it's definitely helpful in monitoring efficacy of therapy, for other diseases, especially like alcoholic, iron, pop overload. And of course, you require tissue for special studies and research. And of course, you do research only when it's ethically approved. The majority of the biopsies are done nowadays for cancers, malignancies, and some chronic liver diseases. It's very few indications are remaining for acute liver disease. For some of the metabolic liver disease, you still have to do and in certain specific post-transplant settings. So some of the common diseases that we do for are for NASH, PBC, so Wilson's disease, certain PUOs, like you find a CMV or a fungal infection, a tuberculosis, and of course some uh, other diseases. We'll come to that later. Liver biopsies also can add to, or at least narrow down the clinical diagnosis. That's very important. We have four or five clinical diagnoses, depending on the lab uh, results, as well as your clinical findings. And then you do a liver biopsy. If you can't pinpoint a diagnosis, at least with the help of ancillary tests, you can narrow it down to one or two, and then it, uh, it at least helps in management of the patient. In children, of course, the uh, indications are a bit different. For example, it's used in various cases of neonatal cholestasis. In uh, certain cases of cryptogenic cirrhosis, especially due to metabolic liver diseases, you can stage chronic hepatitis like in adults. And etiology of duct involvement in certain cases, drug-induced liver disease, as in the adult, and masses, and so on and so forth. So if you come to the um, indications presently, it's for uncertain clinical diagnosis, at least narrowing down differential diagnosis. You can procure the tissue for further analysis, like enzymes, chemicals, microbiological, molecular biology for grading and staging of various um, liver diseases, especially chronic hepatitis and NASH, for follow-up assessment once you have graded and staged them, 
and if there's no other alternative method left your imaging is unhelpful your uh, non invasive techniques are unhelpful then many a time you resort to a liver biopsy and of course to confirm the results of other tests and research so the clinic you have to always remember in adults and in children some of the clinical scenarios are different especially in children where you have a sizable number of genetic or developmental diseases and of course there are many diseases which lacks evidence based guidelines in children and that is why unlike in adults they cannot proceed without a liver biopsy the problems with liver biopsy are there's a high risk uh, especially of hemorrhage then in children you sometimes resort to anesthesia and there are difficulties in getting tissues so the complications are similar to what you see in adults now the biliary system is unique in which it not only has a venous and arterial system it also has a biliary system attached to it and then you could have obstructions and the biliary system passes through the pancreas and therefore pancreatic diseases also can affect it so therefore the you know, in the liver you have two venous systems a portal and a hepatic venous system there's a systemic one then you have an arterial system and a biliary system all mingling in this wonderful organ which has thousands of metabolic functions to do with so therefore the problems are plenty and unfortunately both clinically and histologically the liver reacts in a similar way for example i mean hundreds of diseases can cause cholestasis clinically there's no way to distinguish many of them at best you may say this is obstructive non obstructive many of them most of them cause jaundice there's no way to distinguish clinically what it is similarly histologically many of these changes are almost alike whatever may be the etiology therefore a lot of it depends on clinical pathological correlation which dr epen rightly pointed out so this is the liver most of the biopsies are performed in the right limb therefore if there is patchy disease affecting predominantly the left lobe and not the right lobe you may miss it it happens especially in primary sclerosing cholangitis affecting one portion of the liver more than the others okay i'll not go into the details it's now a day procedure in most institutions but it will do so you have needle aspiration which could be blind or image guided or it could be through endoscopic or surgical punch biopsies when you open the bag now what are the problems in liver biopsy this is one of the reasons why they are not done that often but it's been found that bleeding can be anywhere between 1 in 2500 to very rare 1 in 10000 or even less and minor and major complications are actually less than 10% and major complications are less than 1% in most cases and certain diseases like amyloidosis and other things where there's a lot of deposit of the um, amyloid it can result in a increased propensity to bleeding and of course if you uh, punch into a if you poke your needle into a hemangioma or some other it's say it's going to bleed much more the other complications are pneumothorax home uh, hemothorax perforation of any other organ and so on so forth most of the fatal hemorrhages are associated with malignancies and therefore malignant liver diseases show a greater propensity to risks compared to the non malignant and the what's important is that it's been found that all this to a certain extent depends on the operator and the training of the operator if an operator has performed more than 100 liver biopsies the chances of complications 
are much lesser than those who have performed fewer um, <coughs> liver biopsy. And therefore, during the period of your training, if first supervised and then, of course, unsupervised, if you have the opportunity to do a liver biopsy, please do it so that it helps you later in practice. And a large study recorded fewer complications with the true cut needle than with the mengenine needle. Okay. So, but, um, and a very recent meta-analysis shows the overall, overall bleeding uh, rate was less than 2%. They have studied numerous studies. And the risk factors were older patients or very young patients, comorbidities, especially with coagulation diseases, and if the INR was raised. So anyway, uh, so these are things you learn better. The other problem with liver biopsies is uh, needle tract uh, seedlings, especially when there is uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Therefore, hepatocellular carcinoma is actually now, the, it's been refined so much that in a cirrhotic with raised AFP, I mean, and uh, uh, dual or triple phase CT, you can make a diagnosis. You don't require a liver biopsy. This is one of the malignant diseases where you don't require a tissue diagnosis to start with therapy. Perhaps the other one would be a post-gestational carcinoma. So that's one of the peculiarity of liver diseases. The malignancy where you actually need not, you can start the therapy in certain clinicals. But overall, in experienced hands, the needle biopsy of the liver, I know in our institution, all of them are well-versed and it's very safe. In fact, it is safer than perhaps crossing the road in Delhi. So the chances of you're getting knocked off will be much more than you're dying of a liver biopsy. So anyway, you have to take care and then do it. There are various, various, various needles that you use your own institution will have certain um, needles that they prefer. Your pathologist also will be well versed to report on those uh, biopsies. So stick to it and get trained in that. There's nothing that this needle is better than that and so on and so forth. But in general, for cirrhosis, this cutting type of needles are better than the suction type of the needles. Right? And the other thing is the size of the needle is very important. Don't take small biopsies, you know. For certain things, it's very important that you have an adequate length of biopsy. It's now known that at least if you have a two centimeter length of tissue, that's adequate for staging and grading, especially in chronic hepatitis, because changes are patchy. You can undergrade or understage these, and it will not uh, <coughs> relate very well to your clinical findings. And therefore, if you use a 16 or 18 gauge needle, it is always preferable. And the number of passes, if you, uh, if you take a biopsy and it's say one centimeter, then you can have another pass. If it's two or three centimeters, you need not do, the tissue will be sufficient a maximum of three passes because beyond that, generally the risk of complication increases. For example, if you have an inadequate biopsy like this or this, uh, the findings are difficult to interpret. So the current recommendation is 20 millimeter, but the ASLD, the American groups suggests a three centimeter. So uh, the British groups suggest a two centimeter. Uh, length. So let's keep at least two centimeter minimum with 16 or 18 gauge. We'll come to this. But please ensure it's not very thin. Sometimes the radiologists use the chi bar needle and others which are very thin and not good for interpretation. But it's not necessary. That for all diseases, you require a two or three centimeter. This was a biopsy that we received, a small bit here and a skin here. So a new resident must have done it and pulled out a bit of skin mm -hmm. and this. 
And this was sufficient. It showed amyloidosis. This is the Congo red. Um, and this is the apple green birefringent. And this is thioflavin T, which gives a fluorescent to the amyloid. So this, in fact, uh, it was uh, two or three millimeters in size. This was more than enough to make a diagnosis. But generally, for most indications, you require a good core, or at least four to five portal tracts. Now, the length of biopsy, especially when you're doing grading and staging, because uh, viral hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, is one of those diseases where you do liver biopsies. NASH is another. And of course, post-transplant acute rejection, you do a rejection activity index. So all those, it's better to have a fairly adequate length of biopsy, okay? And reducing the lens, uh, length actually <coughs> led to uh, more of grading, which is milder than it's more severe, you know? So therefore, smaller biopsy will give you a milder grade and that's why it affects the therapy. Same thing happens to staging. You can miss cirrhosis and other things. And almost in smaller biopsies, up to 20%. You may say it's not cirrhosis when there is cirrhosis. Okay, uh, so uh, Dr. Gupta, just one yeah. second. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, uh, I just noticed that uh, the screen is not visible uh, to, uh, to the participants. Is it oh. so? Is it so? Uh, Prasant? It's visible, sorry, visible. <laughs> Okay, so oh. one of the colleagues I told that it's not visible. So, your, your volume can you increase the volume slightly more if it's or maximum? It's a maximum. Perfect. 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 Okay. Thank you. Right. Now, the uh, other. Uh, just one second, sir. Uh, Prasanjit, are you able to see the screen now? All right, sir. All right, sir. Dr. Govind, is this volume better or the earlier one? No, this is, a, I mean, almost similar, sir. This is almost similar. Almost similar? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, your volume is okay, sir. All right. Okay. Perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, the other thing is, what you should not do is, suppose you have three cores, don't send them to three labs. That is something that many people do. It's better you send them all to one place and then take the blocks and then you can take a second, third, fourth, fifth opinion. For example, this three cores, one core showed cirrhosis and two cores showed hepatocellular carcinoma. So now in this case, if this went to one lab, this core or this core, and this went to another lab, you can imagine this confusion in the mind of the gastroenterologist and of the patient and everybody else. So therefore, please send all of them to one place, take the block, and then if you want to have second, third, fourth opinion, you please do it. And uh, the other thing is, for example, this is primary sclerosing in cases of primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is the biopsy. We do it in the right lobe. Suppose it's a small duct PSC and your needle goes through it. Wonderful. You'll get all the changes that are necessary to make the diagnosis. Now, suppose the larger ducts are affected and the biopsy goes through one area where the smaller ducts are not affected. So you will get the features of a bile duct obstruction on biopsy. You will not get the typical changes of PSC because the obstruction is somewhere distal to it somewhere here, not here. And in the third one, suppose it affects mainly the left, lo um, uh, left lobe and these ducts and you are and you're taking a biopsy here. If the bile flow from these ducts are normal, you will not get any changes at all. Therefore, in certain diseases, the liver biopsy cannot be the gold standard. And in fact, for PSC, that's why imaging is the gold standard. So these are some of the limitations that you can have in a liver biopsy. So the errors are unavoidable when the disease is not diffuse, like in chronic hepatitis. The next thing is you must remember needle biopsy samples about 
one fifty thousandth of the liver. You may say, of what use is it then? It is useful because geologists sample at least one millionth of the soil of your earth, and they tell you what's deep inside, whether they will find petrol or not. So similarly, liver, although it samples a bit, it doesn't mean that it won't give you any information. So it gives you. The serial sections are important. You study many sections, and for focal lesions, you take uh, guided biopsy. The other thing is the interpret. If the biopsy is very superficial, normally from the capsule downwards, you get certain septa. So you tend to uh, misdiagnose cirrhosis in those cases. We'll come to that a little later. So this is a you get needle biopsies, wedge biopsies, and because I told you the capsule subcapsular region normally has septa going down, which you can mistake for cirrhosis. The wedge biopsies should always be very deep. It should be like a cup rather than like a saucer, and this is very important because our GI um, surgeons usually take a wedge biopsy. Along with the deeper needle biopsy, when they do a shunt surgery to rule out, you know, to confirm that it's not cirrhosis, and that's why a needle biopsy is looked at and the wedge biopsy is deep enough. So you see, this is the subcapsular region. They have a thick capsule. Normally, just below the capsule, there's a lot of chronic inflammation. This is normal. Why it happens, people do not know. And therefore, if your needle passes through this, you can misdiagnose this as chronic hepatitis with some fibrosis. And look at these septa, how they go in. And therefore, a needle biopsy going through this, you may say there's a lot of fibrosis. Whereas in the deeper area, there's no fibrosis. Therefore, a needle biopsy or a wedge biopsy should be at least four millimeters or more. Deep into the liver tissue, right? So this is very important. The other technical aspect, of course, folded and other sections that the technicians in the lab should be aware of. Do not try to squeeze the biopsy with forceps when you are trying to put it into a bottle. So these are artifacts that one has to remove. The liver biopsies are processed in paraffin. Generally, frozen sections are used for certain. Specific indications, and when you put it in paraffin, it shrinks in size by a few millimeters. That's a, a little longer length would be helpful. And these are the multiple cores that you see. You study serial section. The thickness of the biopsy depends on what the pathologist is happy about. This is a little thicker one. This is a thinner one, and both are equally fine. Generally, five microns in. Thickness, and please work with your clinician, right? The laboratory and ward are the two sides of the same coin, and it's very, very important. You must talk to them rather than exchanging notes of all kinds, of course, between them. It's useful in about eighty percent of the cases, but in some cases, in about twenty percent, liver biopsies may not be a very helpful. Now, if we come to the normal liver, the liver actually diagrammatically shown as hexagon. It's not hexagon; it's almost a continuous view, and it's peppered with certain areas where you have the term branches, uh, tributaries of the terminal hepatic venule, and what is called the portal tract or portal triad. Right? So we'll go into this. And you have cords of hepatocytes in adults with the sinusoids in between, and it's called a sinusoid because unlike a capillary, it doesn't have a continuous basement membrane. So there is a free flow of fluid from what is in the bloodstream into the space in between the hepatocytes and the endothelial or the cuffer cells. It's called the space of dissect, which you cannot see generally. In routine section, and then you have the hepatocyte, right? So, on the other side, between two hepatocytes, they actually cup together 
to form a canal epithelium. There is no lining as such here. There are two epithelium. They form the bile canal epithelium. In fact, it is very peculiar. It's almost like the kidney, where you have a countercurrent mechanism. Here, of course, you have the hepatocytes in between. The sinusoidal blood flows from the portal tract towards the terminal hepatic venule. The bile flows from in the other direction towards the biliary tree in the portal tract. So it's almost opposite direction this flow occurs. Okay. So this is almost like what you see in the kidney. Now this is a normal liver. See, when you see under low power, you will find these areas where there is a little lightly stained fibrous tissue also, and these are the hepatocytes, and these areas where there are just punched out holes without this fibrous tissue. Now, this is called the. These are the tributaries of the terminal. These are the terminal hepatic venules, which drain into the hepatic vein. And this is what is called the portal tract here. And here, if you see in the low part, the largest area which is completely open will be will belong to the portal um, veins. So this brings blood from the portal veins. They are thin wall and large. And then you will find these smaller structures, which are the arterioles and the bile ducts, right? And therefore, you have this actually repeats all over the liver. You have this portal tract. You have the terminal hepatic venule. You have a portal tract, terminal hepatic venule. This will be near the terminal hepatic venule, partly seen, and this will be the portal tract. So therefore, and there's no separation between one lobule and the other that you see in this. They are almost continuous. So they are divided into lobules or acinal. According to the lobular concept, all the portion of the liver around the terminal hepatic venule is called the centrilobular region, and along just along the portal tract, it's called the periportal region, and this is the mid portion of the lobule. But then there's Another person called this Kernian who told it. Another person called Rappaport who gave a concept. It's called a Rappaport's concept. He said, no, the blood flows from here to here. So this is the central portion of the liver. And the blood flows like this in various directions. So actually, you have these berry like areas supplied by the blood going in one direction. And so he called these as an acinus. One acinus is composed of an area in which the central area is the portal tract and the peripheral area is the terminal hepatic venue. And so these are very like areas, rounded areas. This much of blood is supplied first and then this and then this. So this area he called as zone one this is zone 2 and this is zone 3. In fact, the oxygenation is best here and least here. And because they are like this in a circular fashion or very like fashion or oval fashion, this also explains the fibrosis that can occur in these watershed areas. And that's why they are almost rounded in cirrhosis. Anyway, this is a concept that he said. The enzymes etc. in zone 1, a little different from zone 2 and zone 3. Like for example, phosphorus and other things will be metabolized here, INH will be metabolized here, and so on and so forth. So uh, you see, so, so these are the three zones, zone 1, zone 2, zone 3. Now zone 3 roughly corresponds to centrizonal area, zone 1 roughly corresponds to periportal area, and zone 2 roughly corresponds to mid zone. So in the lobular concept, area around the periportal, uh, around the portal tract is periportal, area around the terminal hepatic venule is centrizonal, and in between is mid zone. In the Rappaport's Asinar concept, 
area around the portal tract, like a berry, is zone one. Area around the terminal hepatic venule is zone three, and this is zone two. So in your reports, you will generally find people writing zone one, two, and three, rather than periportal, mid-zonal, and central zone. So this is one thing you have to remember. The second thing is in the portal tract. I told you there's fibrous tissue, and these are the portal veins which are most dilated. And you'll find an arteriole and bile duct. Embryologically, both of them, these arteriole and bile duct, develop together, and that is why wherever there is an arteriole next to it, you'll find a bile duct. So it's very near. In fact, you take the diameter of an arteriole. And go all round, you are likely to hit a bile duct somewhere there. And the diameter of the arteriole and the bile ductule will be almost identical. So, if you want to find a bile ductule, you have to search for an arteriole. And the larger one, this is the uh, portal. Now, here you will find there are these the lobules in pigs and swine are separated by fibrous tissue. This does not occur in human beings, and therefore, it's very difficult to separate lobules in human beings. The other thing is, the uh, there is no fibrous tissue separating the portal tract from this parenchyma full of hepatocytes. So, but the last layer of hepatocytes here is called the limiting plate. So, this is the boundary between the remaining part of the parenchyma and the portal tract. So this last layer is called the limiting plate. Cells can flow from here to here, especially the inflammatory cells, very easily, and they can destroy the limiting plate when it is called as piecemeal necrosis or interphase hepatitis. So what is the limiting plate? It is the last layer or layer of hepatocyte that separates the portal tract from the remaining parent. Now, if you come to the bile duct, see they start with the canals of herring, which are in between the cells, uh, the last the hepatocytes at the limiting plate, and then going. You can't see them normally, and then of course the bile ducts gradually increase in size. Fifteen microns is the size of a say neutrophil. So from that size, they are the small bile ductules or phalangeal. Then they increase interlobular ducts, which you can see usually very easily: septal ducts, area ducts, and large ducts. Okay, so that's how the biliary duct is seen in the portal tract. They are large. Now, in a portal tract, because of the sectioning, you can see all the three structures: bile ducts, hepatic artery, and portal vein. Because you see all the three, that is why it's called portal tract. But it's not necessary that in every case you will see all the three structures in all the portal tracts. So, if you <clears throat> you may see one of them absent. Usually, the portal vein may not be seen. But the important thing of noting this is that in NCPF also you don't see portal vein. Therefore, the clinical findings are very important before you interpret. And just because you don't see in one portal tract, you don't make a diagnosis of NCPF. The hepatic artery may be absent in some, and bile duct may be absent in others. So this is the liver parenchyma, and please note it is nowhere near what is shown in textbooks or what you write. Like it's very nicely arranged in the form of parallel. Cords of cells with the canaliculi here and the sinusoid here. The liver's <coughs> cords are in the form of a maze. It has to slow down the blood. Only then the cuffer cells can find out if the RBCs are damaged or not and engulf them. And the exchange between in the space of DC can occur properly. In an adult, the liver cells are one cell thick. You see this here. Their cords are one cell thick, and sometimes you can see the canalicula here. When it is regenerating, or in children below four five years, they are two cells thick, right? 
they are two cell thick when they are two cell thick it means it is regenerating or that you can get in cirrhosis if it is three or more cell thick then it is abnormal you get that in malignancy or hepatocellular carcinoma this is very important so thicker the cell cord more the likelihood that it is malignant normally the canalicula cannot be seen you don't see bile in the canalicula if you find bile visible in the liver then it is abnormal in a liver biopsy it is always abnormal it indicates some form of cholestasis and bile canalicula are generally not seen bile can be seen in the canalicula or within the cells so if you see within the cell it is called cellular cholestasis if you see in between the cells in the canalicula it is called canalicular cholestasis now there are certain specific terms that we use when we see bile you can call it is called bilirubinostasis because bile is made of bile salts and bile pigment what you see in this green color are the bile pigments it is bilirubinostasis the bile salts are toxic bile pigment is not toxic bile salts are toxic and it causes ballooning degeneration and necrosis of the liver and that is called colate stasis so if you find this ballooning and other things with this bilirubinostasis it is mainly because of bile salts which are toxic it's called colate stasis both the combination of colate stasis and bilirubinostasis or which is generally goes under the name of cholestasis is a manifestation of biliary obstruction due to whatever cause now i talked about canalicular cholestasis the canals of herrings are generally not seen this is at the junction of the portal tract and the last layer of hepatocell cholestasis within the canals of herring if you see especially like this yellowish bile is a sign of septicemia so you can see now here this is canalicular cholestasis and bile duct proliferation all this is a manifestation of obstruction so this is a bile duct proliferation you see with or without cholestasis bile duct proliferation may be associated with infiltration by inflammatory cells so that's another feature of cholestasis when the bile does not flow the other feature of cholestasis when bile does not flow are bile infarcts necrotic areas impregnated by bile especially in the portal periportal area and this is all once again because of bile salts okay and you get bile lakes bile lakes are within portal tracts where the bile because of obstruction and distension they get extra vesicles all these are signs of obstruction the other signs of obstruction that you can get are mallory's hyaline increase in copper binding protein because copper is also excreted with the bile or of copper in the periportal hepatocell so this is again this this large portion in the portal area these are the bile ducts this is the artery please remember that the other thing you hardly get inflammatory cells in the portal tract you can get inflammatory cells normally few in the portal tract and in children you can get extra medullary hemopoiesis these are normoblasts and megakaryocytes within the sinusoid this is normal the space of dise cannot be seen this is one instance in autopsy liver because of autolysis these cells uh, separate out these are the sinusoidal cells these are the hepatocytes and this is the space of dise normally you don't see it this is because of autolysis you can find the sinusoidal cells better when it's when there is malaria because they swell up with pigments or when there is hemosiderin right now this is a liver if you see this is a portal tract what is abnormal in this there is no portal vein this is the artery this is the bile duct there is no portal vein in this 
you see artery is there the portal vein is there there is no bile duct so you see one of them is lost right so that's why people have to examine systematic the other thing is different things may show the same feature here you are finding neutrophils destroying hepatocytes now if you see carefully when do you get it you can get it after prolonged surgery so if uh, if there is an abdominal surgery and the surgeon is handling the liver you get this neutrophils here the neutrophils can be seen also in alcoholic hepatitis in cytomegalovirus infection so if you have a history that there was no cmv or there's no alcoholic hepatitis <coughs> but this is a liver biopsy after a prolonged surgery shunt surgery or liver transplant and you find neutrophil then you report it as surgical hepatitis so this is the importance of history whenever you do <coughs> a liver biopsy so that's why a constant communication is necessary between the clinician and urologist so what are the stains that we do hnd we do usually a diastase pass reticulin meson trichrome these are for fibrous tissue and special stain for copper for iron again for copper and for organisms and then you do immunohistochemistry so this is a pas we do a diastase pass because the liver is rich in glycogen when you do a pas stain a pyruvic acid sheet it will stain the entire thing so when you do a diastase pass it removes the glycogen this is an alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency these are the alpha 1 antitrypsin bodies which are positive here right so that's why we do a diastase pass diastase pass stain is also done to study lipofuscin these are kufer cells with lipofuscin pigment and this can be seen when you are recovering from hepatitis this is a reticulin stain reticulin we see the normal maze like pattern of hepatocytes when it becomes parallel then we worry it shows that the hepatocytes are becoming parallel that we see in drawings and it means there is an alteration in the architecture you see this and you can make out cirrhosis is better because you can see this uh, <coughs> fibrous tissue around nodules with the reticulin stain this is the normal liver when the reticulin disappears then you worry in an hcc you generally the reticulin is lost this is a poor man's way of telling that you are dealing with hcc in an adenomatous nodule there is a partial loss of reticulin because the sinusoids are not formed well in hcc so the reticulin gets lost so this is a cirrhosis biliary type of cirrhosis where you can see reticulin is helpful in other conditions this is a case of portal hypertension looks almost normal but when you do a reticulin stain you will find this this is a nodular regenerative hyperplasia this nodule wouldn't have been seen clearly otherwise the meson trichrome is not helpful the meson trichrome tells you collagen it helps in identifying cirrhosis cirrhosis with rounded nodules is mainly because of hepatitis post hepatitis cirrhosis with this geographic nodules are because of metabolic liver disease or because of <coughs> of biliary obstruction serious red is another stain that we use this is the orsin stain orsin stain stains elastic tissue normally it stains these tissues whenever there is cirrhosis it stains copper binding protein in the peri in the periphery okay it also stains hepatitis b surface antigen so there are several things it stains but better still you can do an immunohistochemistry a surface antigen core antigen core antigen stains the nucleus surface antigens generally stain the cytoplasm there are different patterns of stain right so <clears throat> this is a 3 year old girl with 
congenital hypobilirubinemia and ocular and pulmonary changes what you are finding are portal tracts with portal veins arteries no bile ducts right and if you search all of them there are no bile ducts this is cytokeratin 19 staining which shows no bile ducts right no bile ducts here and this is a normal liver so you are supposed to see bile ducts like this so the immunohistochemistry has helped there's a positive and it's consistent with hepatic changes in allergens because of the ocular and pulmonary change normally if you find arteries the bile ducts are seen in 0.8 the ratio is bile ducts to the portal tract are about 0.8 If it is less than 0.5, it is diagnostic for positive. Between 0.8 and 0.5, it is suspicious for positive. There are various causes. One is allergies, which is syndromic. Non-syndromic, you can get in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Biliary diseases of long-standing, Hodgkin disease, chronic graftosis, host disease, and so on and so forth. The other immunostic chemistry, you can do arginase one. and glycopan 3 which is helpful in identifying hcc so with this we'll take a small break and then we'll do few cases any questions dr ipan please yeah. comment yeah thank you dr dr gupta i will give you view them prashant uh i think you you deserve a 5 okay. 5 five minute break to catch your breath yeah, so uh, we'll just so, do some yeah yeah, yeah. so we no. really really enjoyed your talk i think some questions are coming in let yeah. me start with one or two questions from my end yeah uh first is you so you described a series of stains which are done on liver biopsy yeah would would you recommend that all biopsies have all stains or are there any particular set of biopsies which are uh, standard and some more depending on the clinical scenario how do how do you go about it uh you see in a liver biopsy you no know, which we do generally for hepatitis and other thing the main stay is h and d that hematoxylic myosin then instead of special stains we call them usuals one is diastase pass the other is reticulin and a stain for collagen you do a serious red or mason stain so these four stains are generally done routinely in all liver biopsy then supposing you are suspecting say wilson's disease or anything then you have to do copper stains you want to do for hepatitis b surface antigen nowadays if it's hbv generally we do a immunostochemistry for s and four antigen others we don't do if it is hcv we generally don't do any of so it is hnd diastase pass reticulin and a collagen stain is done in all biopsies then the other ones for iron and you are absolutely right yeah. depending on the clinical or or after doing this all of a sudden we find lot of hemosiderin pigment then we would like to do an iron stain for whatever cause there is and so on so thank you thank you sir this is more of a pathology question only really but it will help the clinician what you just now said is it a practice of one institute or it is a standard across the world this approach to staining of the biopsy what you just now said yeah this is uh, the approach in most uh, all you. over the world okay. even in uk they used to do this same thing most places they do this okay. i have a second question for you again i i expect it may help the clinician see when we do a gastroscopy there is one method of doing it we maybe we look at the esophagus first then you look at the stomach for next in a liver biopsy is there a method is there yeah. a, how do you how do you go about it what are the one or two methods say liver biopsy first you see under low power we scan the entire spine then we begin seeing you know, there there is no hard and fast rule whether you start from the terminal hepatic venule end or you start from the portal end so uh, 
usually because most of the times is done for hepatitis many start from the portal tract end and go to the terminal hepatic venule others for example if there is you know it's a butt carry or most of the changes are from the central area you can start from the central and then go gradually but first on the lower part you see the entire architecture if you whether there are nodules whether there is any inflammation particularly in certain portal tracts like in hcv will be there then you take your focus to that cell and then you start from that see if there is any cholestasis if it's repeating in all the centrizonal area then you know there's some problem in the distal bile ducts you're seeing cholestasis everywhere and so on so so that's how it's done. thank you uh, a lot of questions are coming in the chat yeah. box i think we'll do a few of them and then yes, we'll sir. come back to your talk yes so the first question is from dr deepak kumar how does reticulin and mason trichrome are the different in staining for collagen yeah see the type of collagen that is stained by reticulin is different from the type there are different types of collagen collagen 1 2 3 4 5 6 and so on now the reticulin stains a specific type of collagen that is found especially in the basement membrane lining vessels lining capillaries and so on so that's where it is there and because it's closely associated with the hepatocytes it helps us in giving subtle changes in the architecture the meson trichrome stains the other collagen they are generally not found in the sinusoids normally the liver as i told the sinusoid is fenestrated it's not fully thick or this one others it doesn't allow it stain you will not find meson all the collagen with the meson trichrome stains located there they are mainly in the uh, portal tract from the portal tract if there is fibrosis going here there or for example around the terminal hepatic venule if uh, the collagen very little just around the vein on thin line on the other hand in alcoholic liver disease or in butt carry you will find a lot of these collagen laid there so that's how it helps okay that's why we do both yeah thank you the next question is how to identify the zones i guess is is zone a more theoretical concept or is do it used in practice yeah there is no uh, you know line that this is this zone and that is it's not like the g junction z zone or where you can there are two different it is an approximate thing, you know like okay. your uh, like in the stomach if you want to divide into three areas one third one third one third so okay. it's something like that okay. Okay. Uh, dr priyanka kumari has asked why not rely on wrapper pot system rather than the keenan system any yeah. reasons yeah. when Yeah, yeah in fact most of the biopsies now will tell you about zone 3 zone 1 zone 2 textbooks talk about zone 1 zone 2 and zone 3 more than the usual periportal centrizonal or midzonal areas you are right that's what is being followed in most places now it's gone okay okay here's a question why not do only hne and collagen why do pasd for all patients and keep only it for only for storage disorders yeah pasd helps see we do for uh, hepatitis no pasd also stains lipofuscin so therefore if the lipofuscin is normally found near the centrizonal area it's a normal wear and tear pigment and in some of the hepatocytes so when the hepatocytes undergo necrosis and they are now regenerative and the lipofuscin that was there in the hepatocyte is taken up by the kuffer cells and from the kuffer cells and macrophages it goes into the portal tract so if you find like uh, this diastase pass positive material in the kuffer cells and in the portal tract you know there has been a recent episode of hepatocyte necrosis which you may not see other the other thing is in especially it's i mean it's not required now it was traditionally you know in uk and all they used to always try to screen for alpha 1 anti trypsin deficiency as one of the causes for chronic hepatitis they didn't have that much of it 
So they used to do, and this is one easy way of detecting this. Uh, may I just ask you, sir, in your vast experience, mm. have you come across alpha antitrypsin in the liver in Delhi, or it's uncommon? You know, it's very uncommon, once in a way, and especially because it's a tertiary care institute, no, the pediatricians used to get, but on the run that uh, we have diagnosed and somebody has not thought of it earlier, I don't recall. Yeah. I think the same the experience here, I remember Dr. Banumati Ramakrishna making the same comment that alpha and antitrypsin, like you said, is more of a UK or a European problem rather than what you find in India. Here's a question from Dr. Jayanti, especially in non-serotic portal epithelium, like NCPF, NCIPH, in transjugular liver biopsy, can one reach the porta? Porta. You see, in transjugular liver biopsies, actually, even when earlier institution people were doing, they were not very good. Now, the biopsies that we get are fairly, I mean, through experience and other things, they're fairly good. And we do get a lot of uh, portal tracts. But uh, naturally, in a core biopsy, you tend to get better biopsy. Better biopsy is that. Thank you, sir. Dr. Manmohan has asked, in patchy liver disease, how yeah. can we increase the yield of liver biopsy? Yeah, see, in chronic hepatitis, especially hepatitis C, it's a matter of chance that how you yield. Nobody has found a way, even by doing a fibrous scan or anything, that this area and that area, you can't just make up. It's a matter of chance and usually people, that's why that minimum of two centimeters or three centimeters and the more number of passes up to two or three the yield is more i'll show you what people have found uh, i think i'll take on only two more comments because yeah. uh, it's time that you should come on otherwise uh, the comments will be yeah, yeah, yeah. so here uh, what book is good for beginners in gi and liver path see there's a small book which is relatively good uh, one that is by uh, Peter Shire. That is a smaller book. The bigger book is, of course, Maxine. So uh, there's Maxine. There's one by Sanjay Kakkar. That's also good. So you can take uh, Peter Shire's book, that uh, relatively smaller book. Okay. And okay. actually, uh, you know, Sheila Sherlock's, uh, Dame Sheila Sherlock's uh, hep uh, hepatology book gives a fair lot of pathology in it in each and every chapter. Many best, is, best is, you know, sit with your pathologist yeah. across the microscope and uh, sure. if you are free, actually residents are very busy, you know, but if you, if they can find time sometime and sit and discuss the cases that they have done biopsy. Uh, there's a, lastly, there's a comment from Dr. Matthew Phillip. Yeah. There's a new technique of EUS, endoscopic ultrasound yeah, yeah, yeah. guided liver biopsy, which yeah. is also becoming popular yeah. in India. Any comments on this regarding tissue see, yield? Uh, uh, see, we have very little experience. So, I, EUS uh, liver biopsies are becoming, will, I'm sure it will increase more and more. I think I think Dr. Philip Center may have been doing more, but here, our center, we are doing less. Uh, so, our experience is uh, very little. I, at least my personal experience would be very little. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think we've given you enough time to catch your breath. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, not, no. not really. You've been uh, working hard on here as well. No, Maybe no, we no. can come back to your talk and then take on more questions later. Right. right. Thank you. So now, I uh, see, now they will just go into hepatitis. You see this... Um, why I put this up was, now hepatitis is divided into acute and chronic with the six months. So who found out the six months gap? What is the big deal in six months? The reason why it is six months is, you know, in 1960s, there's been a good paper in Lancet in the 64 or 66, I think that time. But anyway, in 1960s and 50s and 60s, they used to do a lot of liver biopsies in acute hepatitis and chronic hepatitis. 
general consensus after a lot of studies was that the changes of acute hepatitis disappear in six months time and therefore this arbitrary distinction was made that acute hepatitis is less than six months chronic hepatitis is more than six months as the period goes it's realized that of course chronic hepatitis can present clinically for the first time below six months and acute hepatitis of course very rare although there have been case reports of uh, hepatitis e also going on for more than 180 days but so this is how it's mainly histological by and large you don't do a liver biopsy for acute hepatitis acute viral hepatitis is generally not required at all so maybe in acute drug induced or some other cases you may do so the indication is absolutely gone here you may do for subacute right and of course for chronic cirrhosis hepatocellular carcinoma this part so most of the biopsies deal with i think this part of the <laughs> chain here okay now the chronic hepatitis the earlier understanding was persistent if the inflammation was in the portal tract lobular if the inflammation was in the lobular and aggressive if there is a piecemeal necrosis this was worse and of course these had much better prognosis but these are considered separate diseases chronic septal was another one that said it okay now the knowledge regarding chronic hepatitis at that time was scarce now we know there is autoimmune hepatitis b non a non b was then found and then we now know that this is hepatitis c giving chronic liver disease and of course uh, we have this classification now supposing now we have very good non invasive tests molecular biology and other markers to distinguish different types of viral hepatitis your dna levels and other things which will guide you to your management you do not require a diagnosis by a liver biopsy per se to make it whether it's hepatitis b or c so on so forth you require for grading and staging a lot of controversy regarding staging with fibro scan and so on so forth now let's take this history so clinical hepatitis uh, what is the etiology if it is less than 6 months whether it's acute or resolving whether there is exacerbation whether there is fatty change and so on so forth we find in every biopsy now in all hepatitis acute or chronic there is hepatocellular damage if the damage to hepatocytes is sublethal you get ballooning or fatty change the liver cells can come back to normal if there is cell death then it could be because of apoptosis most of the liver diseases we deal with are viral and viral infections cause cell death majority by apoptosis or then it can cause necrosis if the necrosis affects one or two cells it is called spotty or portal if it affects a lot of cells a group of cells 3 4 5 6 or more then you call it confluent necrosis now if the confluent necrosis is between two vascular trees terminal or shall we take from the central area to the portal area or from central to central or portal to portal then it is called bridging necrosis if it bridges two vascular compartments which are well defined it is called bridging necrosis if it affects the entire lobule or acini then it is called pan lobular or pan acini now it affects just between the portal tract and the parenchyma it nibbles into the limiting plate or the interface between the portal and the parenchyma then it is called piecemeal necrosis or interface hepatitis so confluent necrosis could be either confluent you just within the lobule 
few hepatocytes or if it is between two vascular trees it's called bridging necrosis if it is so confluent that it affects the entire lobule pan lobular or pan acinar and if it is at the interface between the portal tract and the hepatocytes affecting the limiting plate then it is called interface hepatitis naturally this type of bridging necrosis is worse from terminal hepatic venule to portal tract because it causes an intrahepatic portal uh, portosystemic shunt that's worse rather than central central like you see in butt carrier venoclusive disease okay right so this is the different type. let us go this is ballooning degeneration in ballooning degeneration this sodium potassium pump is affected like in most injuries you know so the lot of fluid inside becomes large the sinusoids get compressed and in fact lot of ballooning degeneration can compress the canaliculi and cause some amount of canalicular cholestasis and account for some amount of the jaundice that you get in acute hepatitis now some in some cases the ballooning the size does not increase in size and there's wisps of cytoplasm here what people call as uh, <coughs> in uh, <coughs> feathery degeneration now very difficult to distinguish between ballooning and feathery as uh, the only change that people say is feathery the cells are not as enlarged as in ballooning and in feathery you may get some bile bilirubin stasis within the cells and that's why feathery degeneration is almost restricted to biliary obstruction but anyway there's no marks if you cannot distinguish between the two now in children and in others you not only get ballooning degeneration as a form of regenerating change you often get more than 3 2 or more nuclei within the same cell so when you get a large cell with three or more nuclei you call that giant cell and this is typical in neonates and it's called a giant cell hepatitis see more than three nuclei here they are large cells and this is called neonatal hepatitis where you get giant cell so giant cell will have three now the if the cell is not enlarged to that extent and it is almost like this you don't call it ballooning change if it is rarefied like this it could be whether it because of obstruction or when it is absolutely clear with these well distinct cell borders and then you have to do a pass and pass with diastase because this is typical of glycogen storage disease type 1 you can get these cells full of glycogen they also look like that except in ballooning change they will be big here they are not big these large spaces are because of fatty change now here these cells are enlarged they are not water clear you find this small small little rounded nodules so this is foamy degeneration foamy degeneration is generally associated with accumulation of fat within the cells this can be seen in nash it can be seen in glycogen storage disease it can be seen in alcoholic liver disease and various other the important thing is this foaminess is so fine that often you cannot see it you have to do a <clears throat> a lipid stain so these are the different so a cell can be large mainly because of hydropic change when it's a ballooning degeneration it it can be clear in collate stasis it can be clear in glycogen storage disease it can be clear when there is fat in the cells now let's come to the necrosis we are talking about this is spotty necrosis in spotty necrosis sometimes you just don't find hepatocyte you just find lymphocytes there so that itself is spotty necrosis and in liver because most of them are viral infection that we are dealing with when we do liver biopsies you hardly get neutrophils 
So although it may be an acute hepatitis, in viral infection, the cells that go there to um, <clears throat> save us from viral infection are lymphocytes and NK cells. So and that is why you will find lympho mononuclear cells here rather than polymorphonuclear cells. And here in spotty necrosis, single cells get destroyed and you will find lymphocytes. Pondfen necrosis, this is a group of four or five hepatocytes. They should have been there, they are not there. You are finding inflammatory cells. This is confident necrosis. This is piecemeal necrosis. When the boundary between the parenchyme and the portal tract is lost, these to the limiting plate and going inside. This is piecemeal or interphase hepatitis. Now, this is bridging necrosis between one portion and the other. In, or in almost all cases of subacute hepatic failure, you'll find bridging necrosis. And this is panlobular ne necrosis. This is one portal tract. This is, a, this is another. So you see this, this, the entire lobules have necrosed. We'll see other examples. And therefore the liver has, would be shrunken in size. The liver's span will decrease. You do an ultrasound, it'll be a very small liver. These are the cases that present with acute liver failure, fulminant liver failure. Even severe bridging necrosis can do that. Okay, so severe necrosis. Look at this. So this is another form of panlobular necrosis. One portal tract, two, three, four. You'll hardly ever get in a liver biopsy like this. So this panlobular necrosis. Now you see in these cases, the reticulin as well as meson trichrome are unhelpful. And in fact, in a case of bridging necrosis, like if you call this, bridging in this area, panlobular in this area, you can get a combination. If you see the bridging necrosis in this area, if you do a meson trichrome, it gives you a mistaken form that this might be cirrhosis. And in fact, in subacute hepatic failure, you get a spleen that is palpable, a, some little ascites, pedal edema, and a liver that is a little small, although it may not look nodular, it may look nodular in some ultrasound. And if you do a liver biopsy with meson trichrome, uh, it's not actually the deep blue color of this. You may mistake it for cirrhosis. So these uh, stains are not that helpful. On the other hand, if you do an orsine stain in cirrhosis, you'll find this definite nodules of orsine here because they are elastic fibers that are generally restricted around blood vessels in the portal tract normally. Whereas in bridging necrosis, so this is cirrhosis. Whereas in bridging necrosis, the orsin stain will be confined to the portal tract. It will not stain the necrotic area. In fact, <coughs> Shikata was staining these necrotic areas when he by chance discovered that they also stain hepatitis B surface antigen. So this is a good stain to distinguish bridging necrosis from Okay. Now this is how an apoptotic cell looks like. It looks like somebody has put in a syringe and pulled out whatever there was there. So this cell drops out from the scaffolding of reticulin. The architecture is still maintained and the adjacent liver cells re and the cells regenerate to fill up this gap. This is another apoptotic cell. So this is a form of single cell necrosis, spotty necrosis, or focal necrosis. Okay. Now this is an area of pondfrin necrosis. One, two, three. You should have seen two or three hepatocytes here. On the other hand, you are finding a group of hepatocytes that are missing, and there is <coughs> inflammatory cells here. This is confluent necrosis, which is not qualified. Confluent necrosis. This is another area of confluent necrosis in the centrizonal area around terminal hepatic venules. These hepatocytes are lost. So this is uncalled. This would be bridging necrosis. You see, extensive with panlobular necrosis also. 
see here portal to portal they so near naturally the liver span will be decreased in this case and there will be severe is almost like fulminant hepatitis this is a good example of bridging necrosis that was span lobular bridging necrosis see from one area to another from far it looks almost like cirrhosis but it is not these are necrotic areas okay this is the reticulin stain this is the mesons this is once again to show you that the elastic tissue will be absent there and the orsin stain will be negative this you see the this is the interface you can't find the limiting plate these little lymphocytes and other mononuclear cells are nibbling into it and going <coughs> into the lobule this is interface hepatitis or piecemeal necrosis what was called piecemeal necrosis these cells are ringing around a hepatocytes this is called peripolysis around hepatocytes this can be seen in several diseases right right and you see this this is at the border all these lymphocytes plasma cells going into this this is a plasma cell eccentric nuclei with a lightly pale colored off region here they are going into this right so so this is interface hepatitis see here very nicely this is slight ballooning of these cells here yeah and this is the bile duct this will be the portal vein and they are all going here. you can't the margin is blurred and we see how much of the circumference is affected this is more than 50% of the circumference that's affected by piecemeal necrosis see piecemeal necrosis is almost like water overflowing there see this fairly severe here. and this is what was telling in patchy disease so this is so severe here this portal tract the piecemeal necrosis is mild so and here here also my if your needle went through this area naturally you you would have undergraded this and if you go through this area then naturally you would say that this was much more severe piecemeal necrosis here right so this is an eosinophil here so the earlier grading of how much of inflammation was there so you can get inflammation or these inflammatory cells when fine to the portal tract it can uh, go and cause interphase hepatitis or piecemeal necrosis or you can find inflammatory cells within the lobule either single cells will get necrosis spotty necrosis or groups of cells when it is confluent necrosis so an attempt was made how to grade can we grade it is so less or more inflammation so that we can compare the same person's biopsies as the disease progresses rather than two people because there's so much of sampling variability can we also tell is the because the end result of inflammation is healing and repair and in the liver healing and repair results in fibrosis and if the fibrosis is extensive it will result in cirrhosis so inflammation healing and repair resulting in fibrosis and the fibrosis going on to cirrhosis can we grade uh, can we tell how this is going on first attempt was made by nodel et al but the problem with nodel's thing is that there were two problems one is from one it jumps to 3 and 4 sometimes there's a missing number of 2 right the second was that say one there's no 2 3 4 1 no 2 3 and 4 so that was one problem the second problem with nodels is that he combined fibrosis right with inflammation so that was the problem in that so he combined say fibrosis and inflammation together and then you add up all these scores the fibrosis score and inflammation score and then you arrive at a histological activity index but 
one must appreciate this was the first attempt to ever think in this manner secondly it was done decades ago at that time our understanding of both hepatitis and the diseases we knew our non a non b hepatitis c was not there non a non b we knew what it was not we never knew what it was so it was that state of affair we knew about hepatitis b so given all that this was a landmark improvement in hepatology as well as hepatic histopathology this was the first paper and it opened the eyes to the world that this can be done so then later on when we realized that fibrosis and inflammation are two separate things although one leads to another everybody sat together and thought that in malignancy we grade the malignancy as was well we staged the malignancy staging is how far the malignancy has spread and grading is how much the cells resemble the original or different species so the same thing was applied here by pathology so grading is how much of inflammation is there and staging is how much the fibrosis has progressed to cirrhosis and these are two independent factors so you have the international liver group periportal confluent necrosis focal or spotty necrosis and portal inflammation and if you notice confluent necrosis is includes bridging and pan asina necrosis which i told and of course periportal is mild moderate or severe depending on less than 50% of frags or more than 50% and so on so on. portal inflammation mild to moderate so this is what is done the french cooperative group did this for the study on hcv specifically for hcv this is the metavir classification which they did okay and they, there are several other shoyes grading system ludwig batch basically it's similar thing how much of portal inflammation is there how much of interface how much of lobular inflammation and necrosis there and fibrosis how much there is fibrosis stage of 6 in the previous one which i showed you and many thought that a four would be a much easier and better one so it depends what you do so this is mild activity severe activity so similar thing you get to see okay this is no activity yeah okay. this is minimal activity right. moderate severe there is some shaking of this i don't know why okay so uh, these are the things I don't know why it is shaking a bit, Doctor Dutta Gupta. Can I just, yeah, yeah. I think uh, our, we are a time factor is coming in. I think a lot of questions took up time. Okay. So maybe another ten minutes to yeah, cover minutes. what you will we'll finish. Yeah, we'll yeah, finish. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So this is what is done. No fibrosis to cirrhosis. This is the inflammation. So histological would be grade three, stage six. this may not mean much as a clinician so please insist on the pathology writing it is cirrhosis with mild inflammatory activity it will help the clinician it will also tell the clinician how to explain to the patient right so please remember all these changes can be seen in drug induced autoimmune other viruses and so on but in drug induced generally the necrosis is very punched out and clearly marked there are other things this is a cholestatic rosette cells surrounding a rosette like cell surrounding canalicular rosette sorry with bile here this is a cholestatic rosette no canaliculus in the middle why i brought in the term cholestatic rosette is because these cholestatic rosettes are very commonly seen in autoimmune hepatitis okay this interface hepatitis and other things that is remember in acute hepatitis the changes are diffuse it affects all the lobules almost equally centrizonal more than periport but in the this is zone 3 more than zone 1 but in chronic 
it is always patchy and the portal areas are affected more than the centrism so this is how you affect this do you get fibrosis in acute hepatitis no exception is cholestatic fibrosing hepatitis which is seen in immunocompromised individuals post transplant hiv so on is acute hepatitis with lot of fibrosis okay fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis on this can you identify the etiology yes hepatitis b definitely hepatitis c if there is fatty chain portal lymphoid aggregate and so on so okay so this will be hepatitis c you can get fatty chain we see in about 25% of our cases hepatitis b this is ground glass hepatitis okay you can do immunostechemistry or seen stain and so on the only thing that looks like this is after cyanamide therapy or lafora bodies you can do surface antigen core antigen and so on now for example this is a thalassemia with abnormal liver function test hbs negative hcg positive now do you need to do a liver biopsy for, to uh, make a diagnosis not at all you don't require but why do you require a liver biopsy liver biopsy tells you the grading and staging and also how much of hemosiderin is there see this is hemosiderin pigment right in the cells and here this is the pearls prussian blue hemosiderin in the portal tract in the lobule right these are in the along the sinusoidal border of hepatocytes these are in the kupfer cells right how much of fibrosis is there by the reticulin stain nason striker so the biopsy will tell you is mild to moderate activity with fibrosis histological grade is 5 moderate histological stage is 3 the maximum 6 hemosiderin grade is 3 so it helps you you give desferoxamine therapy or whatever and then you repeat the biopsy repeat biopsy helps in the same individual in nash same thing just like that first you have fatty change then the fat <coughs> then you have the steato hepatitis and then cirrhosis of fibrosis so this is the same thing except that fat helps the other thing in nash to want to tell you is you have microvesicular steatosis which is generally just like foamy hepatocytes you have to do this right these are varying grades of fatty chain portal inflammation is less these are the fatty chain which i showed you sometimes you can get small cysts by all these joining together you can get oleogranulomas small granulomas around fat okay you see this very little inflammation you can get mallory's hyaline although this hyaline is nothing as extensive as in alcoholic liver disease in alcoholic liver disease you get more extensive and in alcoholic you get lot of neutrophilic infiltration you can get some portal inflammation these are glycogenated nuclei nuclei which looks absolutely blank you can get it in wilson's disease you can get it in diabetics you can get it in nash right these are mega mitochondria they are not alpha one anti trypsin bodies large mitochondria right and the fibrosis is pericellular or chicken wire around individual cells okay this pericellular fibrosis around individual cells which you get in nash this is another example and then of course you can get cirrhosis so in pediatric it can resemble the adult or it can have a separate connotation right okay type 1 is less common zone 3 fatty chain common in adults and it resembles the if common in girls resembles adults this is more common in boys where there is zone 1 fatty chain fibrosis is portal you can get less 
in nash also you get steatosis balloony inflammation state bank of india steatosis <laughs> balloony and inflammation and you do it grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 similar thing what you do is it less than 5% 5 to 30 5% is the cut off because in ultrasound the minimum that you can find out is 5% okay that's what you it's less than 5% is normal so this is how you grade steatosis and then you grade the fibrosis also how much there is okay this is similar to what you do this grading staging systems are similar but please remember you cannot diagnose nash based on grading and staging just as you cannot diagnose hepatitis the it the histological diagnosis should come first and then the grading and staging so this study clearly shows by brunt and their group which is the largest group doing they are studying nash that if you do a histological diagnosis and you do a grading often you can by just grading you cannot make the histological diagnosis it's very important to realize that okay so this is a case of a non alcoholic the steatosis inflammation ballooning malary dank bodies and reticulin stain tells you so micronodular cirrhosis you grade you stage this please remember this is a study which shows that the disease activity is underestimated if the biopsy is thin and if the biopsy is not long okay so there's a clear study by this group which appeared in hepatology and like for example if you take from the left and the right lobe also there is a difference in the grade and stage almost in one third to one fourth of cases as high as this. it may be lower also so therefore in patchy disease this will always be a problem you may always curse your histopathologist that is not correlating clinically or vice versa so and so this will always be there. please remember cirrhosis is not the end stage now it is known that if you have thin fibers with large nodules okay so it is better so thin fibers has a better prognosis thick fibers has worse prognosis small nodules carry a worse prognosis than larger nodules okay and cirrhosis can be sub classified into 4a 4b 4c depending on the nodule size and this has been correlated with your hepatic venous portal gradient If you use ten as the cutoff, no, depending on the nodule size. Is the larger nodule and smaller nodule? Look at this. Okay, and septal thickness. There's a very good correlation between thin and small nodule, large nodules and thick. So that can be included in the diagnosis. Okay, so progressive and if the septa are not complete, it's predominantly. regressive so this there is a beijing classification related to this you can read about it so this person is likely to do better this cirrhotic is likely to do better than him or her so there is a grading of cirrhosis that is there nowadays there is another grading that is done this is the for uh, rejection and please remember in rejection what i wanted to show you not only you have portal inflammation you have what is called endotheliitis these inflammatory cells literally peel off the endometrium uh, endothelium and this could be in the centrizonal area or in the periportal venule you also get eosinophils right in uh, uh, acute cellular rejection look a lot of endotheliitis you can get cholestasis look at this endotheliitis so this is mainly to show you what you get in acute rejection you can get ballooning you can get cholestasis which is same and in chronic rejection of course you can get paucity of bile ducts and foamy cystitis and because basically there's loss of bile ducts it looks like obstruction and so on so 
So this is the last case you will find raised gamma glutamyl transaminase. This got itching, cholestasis, and you are finding a granuloma, right? So this is a PBC because this is biliary centric. You can get a granuloma in tuberculosis also, in sarcoidosis also, right? So the clinical finding is very important. Another obstructive jaundice, you are finding the bile duct there, but if you keep searching, there's some loss here and cholestasis. And if you see here, there is this onion skinning. So you can say it is suggest, and there is this orsin with these brown, brown things, which are copper binding protein consistent with primary sclerosis phalangitis. This is a hepatocellular carcinoma, no mark. So you also do biopsy sometimes for malignancy. This turned out to be a hepatocellular carcinoma or an adenocarcinoma. Now, this is an important slide. You know, this was study done in 93, but it's true even today. Supposing you take a biopsy, you have a report, and then you sit with your pathology. You have a conference, clinical pathological conference, and these are breast, dermatology, ENT, oral, general surgery, oncology. The maximum changes in the diagnosis happened with gastroenterology. So it clearly shows there are so many areas, even in oncology, there are some, but in oncology, you now have a lot of immunostochemists, others, they tell you what tumor it is to a large extent, a lot of molecules. In gastroenterology, there's so much of clinical pathological correlation to be done, whether it's hepatology or luminal, it's absolutely mind boggling. There is no doubt in fact, the printed paper that goes to you as a report may be the quarterfinal or semifinal. You have to sit with it. You have to sit with your pathologist. The pathologist has to sit with the clinician. You just cannot exchange one sends a requisition form, another sends a report. It's better we do away with all that as far as GI pathology goes. This is true even today. There are studies to show that. But this was quite dramatic. That's why I wanted to show you. So thank you very much. Sorry if I haven't taken time. I haven't covered everything. I just went through most of it. Thank you, Dr. Epen. I'm sorry for, for, for exceeding the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. It's a very vast area and it's difficult to know what to talk on, which topics to pick up. I can understand right. your dilemma, yeah, yeah. but really enjoyed uh, what, you, uh, what you taught and uh, shared your vast experience. Uh, I would ask Govind what to do because I, I know that we have uh, run over time. So I'll hand back to Govind to ask for his comments. Uh, any I want to discuss some questions. Or we take a poll questions. Can we take some poll? Because I, can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. So we have some poll questions, which just show us. Uh, can you launch the poll, Prasant? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we'll have some poll questions. I think you respond, you know, all of you should respond. Uh, what do you mean? like these poll questions? Yes. So just respond to this question, please. That is very fantastic. Dr. Gupta, you have you have, you have impressed them. So I think everybody is right in that, that case. <laughs> so this is going very well. So the, you are able to see the results, sir? No? Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, good, good, right. good. Very good, very good. Second question. Second question. Second question. Second question? Yeah. yeah. Question two. Uh -huh. yes.
Excellent. Hundred percent of the nature. So are you happy with? Uh, yeah, yeah, very good. You know, the answer is bridging necrosis, which most of you told. It is between one vascular tree, that is the hepatic kidney, and the portal tract. So it bridges two vascular tree. So bridging necrosis, those who have said, very good. Pan lobular is the entire portion going on. Okay. And then piecemeal necrosis is at the interface between the portal tract. And the hepatic gland. The next question, please. In this, no, the, still going on. the answer is orsin stain. Because you see, the orsin fibers are located only in the portal tract. And when the anther reticulin is present both in the lobule and when there is necrosis, the reticulin framework collapses. And because it collapses, no, it looks almost like fibrosis. So reticulin stain is not good. So the orsin stain, which will not be there in the lobule, if there is cirrhosis, it will go in like this, when there's fibrosis. If there is necrosis, it will be negative. So orsin stain is the stain that is used in this. That's a tough question, I, sir. That's a tough question, I know. Uh, so that's a tough question. Last poll. Uh, last question, last poll. So this depends on, ah. is it American or European? <laughs> I think everybody is European. Most of <laughs> wow. I mean, ASLD says 30 millimeters, what you said. Yeah. yeah. They said 20. More the merrier, but at least 20 it should be. And okay. yeah, up to three passes. Yeah. Very good. Any more? I think there's one more. Eh? One more, maybe one more. Uh, Prasant, one more, last one. Yes. Yeah, bile is the best answer in this. You may see occasionally very rarely plasma cells. Lipofish can normally see reticulin fibers. Good, good, good. You know, they are going to put me out of business. <laughs> they, have known, they have done very well. No, actually, most of them are DM students. They are, all of them are bright boys and girls. So. And it's uh, very heartening that that they have been able to, <clears throat> you know, tolerate uh, so much of pathology for quite some time. For, and <laughs> so it's, it's, so, it's sir, very heartening. Thank you, Govind. Uh, sir, thank you so, so, so very much. I think it was a so engaging lecture, starting from the need for biopsy indications and, and what are the options available. What are the complications? I'm talking about 
each aspect of liver inflammation, what is piecemeal, what, what is the interface, what is spot necrosis, what are the stains we do, and how do we stage and grade of disease, both for hepatitis and also for, for fatty liver disease. It has been really remarkable. Your slides, your depiction of the line diagrams have been fantastic. I mean, so mm -hmm. difficult to, uh, for all of us understand, to understand the liver pathology because we're not tuned to see uh, these, 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 I mean, we have different different picture in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you added value to that uh, that learning learning process. I think uh, we are getting that some feel of it, uh, that uh, how the lobby looks like, how what will be single cell necrosis, what will be conferred necrosis, what will be pan level necrosis. So I think uh, these keywords, uh, I hope is uh, very valuable to all our participants. Uh, and and uh, this uh, it has been remarkable. And I would say typical masterclass by you, by you, sir. Yeah, no, and thank, you. Again, thank you so, so very much for your very elaborated discussion on, the, on this uh, topic. Uh, we are sorry that uh, we asked you to stop in between and we no, 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 fast not forward. Not uh, we fast forward in the last moment. But uh, since, uh, since this is a, no, no. Uh, we, we crossed some time, so that, therefore, the apology for that, sir. Not, uh, at all, not at all. I am, in fact, I'm honored that uh, Dr. Epen was there and you are there, Dr. Goenka is there. And yeah, you had a lot of wonderful students, I'm sure. And uh, not only that, I am really so grateful to all of, uh, to all of you for <coughs> and for we have also bombarded very, with yeah, very senior people in the audience also. Not only students uh, or okay. trainees, but there are many senior people like Jayanti. I can see a number of okay, them okay, okay. Uh, in the audience. So it's like a pen GI. Uh, Oh, I'm on oh, the really conference. Uh, Dr. Epen, thank you so very much again. You always yes. are so elegant, so elegant. Thank you. Dr. Add value to our our uh, master classes. Uh, always. Thank, you, thank you so very much, everyone, for joining in. That's on Sunday, and that's also uh, is is very precious to us that uh, you join for the master classes. And I, I be, we strongly believe this is a good way to educate or share our knowledge with each other. Uh, staying distant, but again, still we remain connected with each other uh, through these uh, master classes. Uh, thank I, you so very much, everyone. And uh, Govind, I think this online thing has helped. Yes, yeah, sir. there are so many people from all over the yes, everywhere to join these classes. Except that, of course, they'll miss the lunch which ISG provides so, <laughs> <laughs> so, <there's, laughs> so lavishly always. Anyway, thank you so much. And, thank, and, you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Ray, sir. I mean, and and lastly, uh, we will have a next master class uh, on. Uh, so we'll have a master class every other Sunday. So we'll skip next Sunday and we'll have a next master class on 29th of May. And again, this is a uh, important topic. And how do you interpret small intestinal biopsies, uh, celiac disease, tropical screw, Crohn's disease, and so many other diseases uh, we'll discuss. And this masterclass will be done by a very dear colleague. And I think is, is a, uh, again, one of the students of Dr. Dutta Gupta, uh, there's a Prasanjit Das. Yes. And he's very elegant mm -hmm. and very thorough, very um, very meticulous. So we'll have a next masterclass on uh, interpretation of small intestinal biopsies on 29th of May, two weeks from today. Till then, thank you so very much. And, and do join in for the next masterclass and have a great day ahead. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Prashant. Thank you, Prashant. And thank you, Nisa, for organizing this for us. And thank you so very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gonga. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Prashant.